Hello everyone and welcome to another Royal Automobile Club talk show in association with Motorsport. I'm Ed Foster and I'm joined by editor-at-large Simon Aaron and three-time Formula One world champion Sir Jackie Stewart. Sir Jackie, a very warm welcome to the Murray Walker television room at the club. It seems an appropriate place to be doing this. There's a special dinner for you tonight in memory of that championship 50 years ago. Does it feel like 50 years? It doesn't. I I have no idea of years at all, and neither my age or even when I finished motorsport. It's been such a fast life, and the life thereafter, the driving, has probably been even faster. So it's it's been a very happy time. Now, before we went on and talked about that that championship in '69, I wanted to pick up on something that you mentioned. I think with Simon Taylor in a lunch with interview, where the um, you managed to develop a memory, a photographic memory, where you could remember every corner, every breaking point, for every circuit that you raced at. Is that amazing to be able to do that after, obviously, the, the history that you had? I think it's even more amazing the fact that I'm an extreme dyslexic. Mm. And, I mean, right now I can't recite the alphabet. I don't know the Lord's Prayer, and I, I don't even know the National Anthem. I can't remember them. And yet I could give you the Nürburgring, um, 187 s- corners per lap, 14.7 miles, I think it is. And I can remember all of that uh, and probably give you the gear changes as well. So it's totally contradictory and I, I can't account for it. I mean, people would say, well, you must have just not been concentrating on school. But when you're a dyslexic, it's a major disruption to your life. And for many, it can be very disruptive to a point of all sorts of bad things happening. And yet here, my motor racing uh, hasn't been affected by it at all. Uh, did the ability to memorise the Nordschleife and the other circuits in such detail, the breaking points, etc., did that come naturally or did you have to work at that? No, I'm not aware of having worked at it. I mean, I, I don't remember anything about working at my profession. Maybe until the very end, when I was starting to realise the things I had been doing were pretty okay and then reliving them a little bit because keep in mind that I knew that I was going to retire in April of 73 and it didn't finish until October that year and somehow or other because I was going to every race for the last time I took a bigger interest in the driving actually and by which time I had learned the smoothness and the tidiness of driving. Um, but I learned that mostly from Jim Clark, actually. Um, so it was, uh, you know, people think that you've collected more information than you really have. Of course, part of it is not only consuming it, but actually banking it and being able to rewrite it uh, your own way. And that's where I think my my good fortune came from. You had a very dominant year in 1969. I mean, you had some tough opposition, Jochen Rindt particularly. But when did you start to believe that the World Championship was something that was achievable for you? You know, I never did. Never at any time. Um, the World Championship was obviously there, but I never thought of it I never thought of myself being world champion. Um, And even when I won it, uh, my first words are, are you absolutely sure, Ken? Uh, (laughs) Because Ken was all over me. (laughs) Uh, Are you absolutely sure? And the last one was even more, are you absolutely sure, Ken? Because I had come from the back of the grid. Well, I had a puncture in, I think, second or third lap. And in those days... (laughs) I don't know how long the pit stop was, but it, it was wasn't two point. Se- it wasn't two point four seconds. No, it certainly <laughs> wasn't one point six, one point eight at yeah, some time yeah. recently. But no, no, no. I mean, it was so bad. I mean, it might have been. It was nearly a whole lap um, before I got back out, and I managed to clear up. You know, the lap record probably more times. I think I understand. Somebody told me than any other lap record record, so to speak. Um, And it was funny, Ken tried to keep me interested, I think. At one point, he put the board out, you know, tell me how many seconds I was behind. But on this occasion, it was minus 20 Fangio. (laughs) 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 
and again at that time when I finished the race and they said you know you've got the championship to I said are you absolutely sure I mean amazing because the, there, were, there were some races in 69 that you won by quite some margin and Simon and I were talking before this and obviously one was because uh, Rint had a slow puncture at Silverstone um, but there's Monduric there was Clermont um, by the way Rint wasn't a slow puncture Oh, was it not? No, it wasn't. The, the, the I shouldn't rear, listen to you, Simon. The, <laughs> rear, the rear, um, uh, rear wing end plate was touching, and that's why I went alongside and told them to look back, because we, we knew each other so well, and we had been signalling each other all the time for passing going down hangar or passing going into Woodcock. That was why we, I mean, we lapped the whole field, because we weren't holding each other up. Most people would be pushing and shoving. We weren't. We were fingering each other to s tell them what side to pass because we knew the drafting in those days was very obvious but uh, he went into the pits because we ge I genuinely was worried that it was going to blow a tyre and he saw it as well finally he didn't see it until I pointed it out to him but when he got there the car ran out of petrol it wasn't a flat tyre the car ran out of petrol. They had to put petrol in it. And in those days, you could put petrol in. So, Jackie, I cannot tell you how happy it makes me that Simon got a, 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 a lesser known motor racing fact wrong. It's wonderful. May, may I say it may not be the first time. Almost <laughs> 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 well, no, certainly not. <laughs> so, but g going back to the, the question, the, you, know, you, you were very dominant that year in, some, in, in many of the races. But when you're in the championship and in those races, does it feel like you're being dominant ever? I mean, you know, we see Lewis Hamilton at the moment. No, I never did ahead. feel like that. I, I mean, I always thought somebody was better than I. Always. I never... They either had better tyres or a better car. or I couldn't tell them they had a better engine because we all had Cosworths at the front end of the field. And that was the great thing of my period, in my opinion. I would have... If you had bought a Cosworth... And you had phoned up Jackie Stewart and said, listen, I've just bought a Cosworth. Would you drive it? You know, in a Grand Prix. I would have said yes. I was so confident of Mike Coston and Keith Duckworth and their team of people. Nobody got a horsepower extra. Nobody that I'm aware of. And I was keeping an eye on that. And nobody was getting any advantage. So that was the great period of it. I think that was the, the most important part of why that era was probably one of the best that's ever been in respect to the fact of so many cars were arriving with the same engine. So it was a, a very good period at that time. And, and, and you weren't allowed to get an engine that was any faster. So it was, of course, in the chassis, of course, in the aerodynamics, which were very primitive in those days. But that's why it was such a, a I think, it's such a good period. And, and so many top, top drivers. I mean, Brabham, Clark, Hill, Eamon, um, Fittipaldi, if you think of Jimmy, dropped out, obviously. But if you think about it, there was about eight or nine I think any of the drivers that could win races, could win Grand Prix, Benny Holm, etc. And uh, all with the same engine. And that's where I think it's, it's maybe a unique period in the history of Formula One. And you, Tyrrell wasn't run from a big glass palace with a thousand people. It was run from a woodshed in Surrey. How many people did you have working in the team? And it was, a, I mean, it really was. And, uh, 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 and I went to the Ford Motor Company. I said, you know, for your museum, it, which it really truly is, you know, the, the, in Detroit, they've got the most wonderful uh, history of motoring and so forth. I said, you know, you've got to buy Ken's wooden hut because nobody will believe that a car three times won the world championship in a wooden hut. Uh, it was amazing. Um, but... He chose his engineers so well. He looked after them very well. He had a pension where nobody else had pensions he, for his mechanics. And he had uh, life insurance. And that was an enormous thing with regards to people getting injured or hurt. They had health insurance. And I don't think any team at that time had that. And that's Ken was an amazing man when it came to all of that. He looked after his staff so, so well and, of course, kept them all the time. Can, can you remember how many people worked on the team at that time? We would normally go, there would be uh, seven, seven or eight people. 
So what, what do you think when you see today that, you know, <laughs> Mercedes have got a thousand or however many it might be? Well, I, I'd say seven people going to a track, going to a race. Mm. Um, now there's more than 100 people go to a race. It's just a different world because now there's an aerodynamic that then there's a, uh, there's an electronic that and every area whether it's transmission or whether it's the engine or whatever else is there um, it's just developed but then again it always has if you think back to the great days of Maserati and Ferrari and Mercedes Benz and so forth uh, in those days they had not the number that exists today. But the technology, of course, is more numerous today in any case. But it's developed into a, a giant, in fact, a monster almost. Sorry, to know someone on you go. <coughs> I was going to say, um, you were famous at the time for your safety crusade, but you were still racing at, at not every year at the original spa, but some years at the original spa, the Nordschleife. How, d how did you reconcile that with the the, the safety pro the safety developments you were you were seeking um, with some difficulty in a sense but you know when the visor goes down the lights go out to a very large extent uh, you know while I was fighting the Nürburgring particularly and spa particularly because these were by far both the most dangerous racetracks I still won, didn't win at Spa. Um, in fact, when we closed Spa, I did win the Belgian Grand Prix, but not at Spa. Yeah, yeah. Um, spa wasn't all that difficult, actually. Nürburgring it was a giant, and that was by far the most difficult Grand Prix circuit. And everybody talk about Eau Rouge being the ultimate circuit. It wasn't. The ultimate corner was the master curve because you were flat in a one and a half liter or a two liter, you were flat through the master curve, right, left, right. And by the way, motorsport, at the very last one, there was a big house with gray, with gray stones, and there was a wee man with a Dennis beard. Dennis Jenkins hiding to see who was With his head yeah. only <laughs> out the side of that thing, and sure enough, every, and I could see it was, it was Jinx. And that was the, you see, there's, he, he was the big expert. He knew where to go. And the master was where you went, not au rouge. It's, it, you know, we always hear the stories of, you know, the race, Formula One races being boycotted and things like that in order to improve the safety. But did you have circuits at the time that you loved going to? Yeah. The, I loved the Nürburgring. I, I was <laughs> frightened of it. Every time I left house, I've, you may have heard this before, I looked in the, my mirror of my car when I drove out my drive, thinking, am I ever going to be coming back here? It was such a challenge. You know, they did modifications along the way, but at one point we took off 13 times in the air. Now, these cars could take off quite well, but they never landed very well. I mean, people just don't understand, I don't think, the, the elements that we were competing against in those days. But we were almost unaware of them too. We were just driving as hard as we could. But racing cars, sometimes they took off quite well, but they didn't land well. <laughs> Hardly ever. I've got a great picture of my BRM coming down on one front wheel, for example, from, you know, not quite a metre, but pretty close. Um, so I was never frightened of them, but I, I was thinking from time to time it was pretty silly. And for that reason... You know, I was probably the most unpopular racing driver in the world at that time um, because I was president of the GPDA and somebody had to speak out, but I was also world champion. So my voice was louder from media, for example, and from the dailies, not just the monthlies or the weeklies. Um, but it was, it was, it certainly wasn't a happy time. It was the most difficult time probably of, of my life. Um, turning around and saying, you guys, we've got to we've got to not go there. Because if we don't go, they will change. Um, but they won't change without us standing up on our own two feet. And it was in the Dorchester, actually, 
and Louis Stanley was the secretary at that time of the GPDA, and I think there was 11 Grand Prix drivers there. It was Bruce McLaren's memorial service at St Paul's Cathedral. We went back to the, the, the Dorchester to the suite that Louis, Louis Stanley had, and it was a real drama because they were all frightened to lose their drive. You know, if we say we're not going to drive, well, I'll get somebody else to drive the car, and they would lose their drive, a big fear. Ken wouldn't have done that with me, but maybe some other owners would have done. But it was Jack Brabo that tipped the balance, and he stood up and said, we've got to go with Jackie on this, because if we don't do this, we're never going to get what we need, and it's ridiculous. Keep in mind that in 68, we lost a Grand Prix driver in in four consecutive months, Jimmy on the 7th of July. Now, Scarfiotti was in a hill climb, and Mike Spence was at Indy, but they were Grand Prix drivers, and then Joe, Sleep, uh, Joe Slesser died at, at Spa. At Ru Rouen. At Rouen, yeah, sorry, yeah. at Rouen. And, and on fire, we all drove through the fire again. We all drove through the f fuel and fire, magnesium car and fire. We did the same with poor, you know, the other spa when Piers Courage died. We knew it was Piers. Jim and, and, and Jochen and I were best friends with Piers, and we knew it was him. And we knew he wasn't dead. His helmet was on the track. So we knew, but we're still driving through the flames. So the whole thing was ridiculous. They didn't never stop a race. You know, when, when he died, they never stopped the race. When, when Williamson died, they didn't stop the race. Uh, it was just ridiculous. And, and people will say, oh, that was awful. Why didn't you stop and help? That wasn't, the, I mean, it's not the culture. It just, you never did that. You raced on. It was a, a mentality and a maybe a wrong thing, but that's what we were at that time. And everybody, it wasn't just a question of Jochen and I, that was the way it was. Just going back a second to the Nürburgring, one thing you didn't mention, I'm pretty sure is correct, that in 1968, when you went there by about a fortnight or four minutes or whatever it was, um, in the mist and the rain and the fog, um, didn't you have one of your wrists in the plaster cast? Yeah, I, following the Formula Two shunt earlier in the year. <coughs> I broke my scaphoid. I didn't know it was a scaphoid, and I didn't know what a scaphoid <laughs> was. But it's the <laughs> deepest um, bone in your whole body. It's tucked away very kindly, and it takes twenty weeks to repair. And I found this out by going to Muhammad Ali's doctor because they told me in Spain. They told me when I got back to Switzerland. They told me in England. I flew a specialist in from England to Switzerland. Oh, why, you've got your scaphoid. Um, and then he went on to say, 20 weeks, this is what everybody said. And I said, well, then I went to America, and then I went to a, a basketball, the best basketball college up at, above Indianapolis, actually, Indiana State. They were the best. And I thought, well, they must be. They must know about that. Oh, yeah, you've got the scaphoid. Oh, bad luck, 20 <laughs> weeks. <laughs> so, so, so I came back. To Switzerland, and then I found a specialist who did artificial limbs and maybe arms as well. And uh, Armand's his name, uh, Luc Armand's now was Bernie's, maybe still is Bernie's lawyer. And his father was a top man in that field. And he said, "Oh, why don't we do a a mold for you? And we'll do it in such a way that you won't get any movement from the scaphoid." And um, it'll carry you through. But, of course, it wouldn't be that easy. Right hand, gear shift on the right hand side. And uh, it was tiring. Uh, but I would never have won the Nürburgring if it had been dry. Because the G-forces then and all the bumps and the bangs. Because when it's really wet, you're not even taken off the ground. So it was a big, long... I lost the World Championship, I think, generally, because it, cause I missed some races. Um but it was amazing that it worked. So it was in plaster all the week until a Thursday night. Then it cut off the plaster, put on this thing, which is now lying in Paris at the FIA display cabinet. Um, and I won the Nürburgring. I won the Zandvoort race. I won two or three Grand Prix with this thing. And it just worked. 
So you're the only driver who woke up happy that it was raining at the Nürburgring that morning, probably. Well, I, I even wasn't happy. I didn't <laughs> the race. We, we couldn't see. the. I mean, twice the size of this room, you could not see. But you did, I think the first thing you asked when you got out of the car at the end of the race was, is everyone OK? That's the first thing I asked Ken Tittle. I said, is, is every because he was a happy chappy. And I said, hang on, is, is everybody OK? Because at the ring, you don't know when people have gone off the road because it's a drop off usually or into trees or bushes. And he said, no, I think everybody's OK. Because it, that that was the weekend in August of the seventh, we, the weekend that that was where everybody was getting killed. And the Nurburgring, you would have expected that because several times I was there, people were killed. Um, now we, we've only got sort of five minutes left, and I want to just touch on a little bit about current Formula One. Um, one thing I'm, I must ask you about is the Goodwood Festival of Speed this year, um, and what a lovely, lovely moment it was to have yourself and your two sons, and Dario was, was there as well in the BRM, going up the hill together, yeah. and then uh, to have the presentation in the house, and your wife, Helen, below, um, smiling from ear to ear. It was truly, for all of us, it was magical, but I hope, obviously, for you it was as well. Well, it wasn't a planned thing. It just so happened, and, and Mark actually gave me the rose. Uh, when I stopped, and I knew where Helen was, because I, she couldn't see it before, so I told the two nurses, I think one of them's here tonight, actually. There's two Helen has all of the time, 24 hours a day. We've got seven all together, but, you know, two at a time. So I knew where she was, and that's when I stopped and gave her the flower. Uh, and it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't a Hollywood one. It was just one of these things. And uh, it was nice. And it was nice that Daria was there, too, because, of course, he had been part of post-shoot racing and everything like that. Yeah. But uh, 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 sad that I had to do it, if you like to look at that way, you know, because of Helen's illness, because currently there is no cure and there's no preventive medicine. So it's not a good time in that respect. But I think the work, obviously the work that you're doing um, is, is making a difference, is it not? I think we're breaking new ground. We're using Formula One, by the way. We're using both Red Bull and McLaren. Um, I had the Minister of Health at McLaren 10 days ago, letting him see how quickly problem solving is done and everything's immaculate and clean and tidy and the people are tidy and clean and immaculate in every way. Um, and that's what I have not found yet and it might not be well taken by the medical world, but it's nothing like as tight as Formula One. So I'm using that as a model for the PhDs that we're buying at a considerable cost, because it costs about 150000 a year, but you've got to pay the money in full for five years uh, in advance. So we've only got five at the moment um, that we can afford, because we're raising money. It costs a lot of money. But it, it, for 30 years, nobody's found a cure or preventive medicine. That's not right. That's not what motor racing does. So why is medical not as fast at breaking new ground? Now, unquestionably, the brain is the most complicated piece of kit, way ahead of aerospace as complications. And they, nobody's really got that yet. Nobody knows why a huge percentage, and we're talking about more people dying with dementia than any other illness right now and it costs more because many dementia patients live for quite a long time because they sleep a huge amount of time so they're rested their heart's not infected at all it costs more money to to look after a dementia patient than the combined total of cancer and heart disease each year so we need to find a cure for it well it's it's amazing amazing what you're doing um and I just wanted to touch quickly on current Formula One. Simon and I were talking beforehand that Ross has obviously, Ross Braun has come in and is hoping to try and make some changes to Formula One to make it more exciting, to make it appeal to more people. Um, but he seems to be always sort of stopped by the politics of it all. What would you be doing if you were in charge? Is, I mean, it, what is the, the route forward? Well, I think Ross is the right man, first of all, because he's, he's a racer. You know, he... He's as good as you get. What he did with Ferrari and with, you know, all the success that they achieved with Michael Schumacher, et cetera, et cetera. And he's very level-headed. He's, nobody can buy him. That's 
an important element. Um, and his heart's behind it as well as his head, and he's got a good head. So I think the safety elements, I still don't think that the Grand Prix Drivers Association have anything like as much influence as they should have, because at the end of the day, they are, they are the guys out there. Ironically, just the Mexican Grand Prix, the accident that um, Bottas had, he, he was trying to keep the power on going around the last corner on qualifying, heading for pole, and he just didn't have enough road, but he kept going. He hit the wall, and it ran very fast, and then there was a difference in the depth of the wall by about, well, about 12 to 15 inches sticking out before the rest of the barrier continued, and that's where all the damage was done. Now, today, it's a deformable structure. The cockpit is a survival cell. If that had happened in the days that we were speaking of earlier, somebody would have been desperately injured. But the cockpit now is absolutely great. The driver's tucked away. The deformable structure of the racing car is allowing that driver to survive. And so also is the barrier. So it's been a great change from a designer engineering side as well as it has been for us to have influenced the racetracks to have to change. Because I believe sincerely that if we hadn't done that way back in, in the 70s, I think Formula One would have ended because of insurance companies. Because there was going to be a big accident that could easily have been a Le Mans accident. And nobody was paying attention to saying we've got to have debris fences like they have at Indianapolis. And even since then, Indianapolis have improved the debris fences. So we were way behind. It wasn't a question of Jackie Stewart being a pussy. It was uh, the, f the fact that my reality was this is serious because major multinational corporations don't like to see death that they should be considered part of. So whether it's on the track or whether it's the manufacturers themselves, if it's not socially correct, they come out. And, you know, Switzerland today has no motorsport racetracks because of the Le Mans accident. So it was heading in the wrong direction, and it wasn't a popular thing. It was the most unpopular thing I did. I mean, I, you know, people like to celebrate success and so forth. I, I didn't get as much because of that, because a lot of people were saying it's pussycat. He it hasn't got it. But had we not done it, I think we would have been in serious difficulty. Well, I, I think I speak for pretty much everyone out there now. Um, everyone is extraordinarily grateful for what you did. Um, I, some people might have noticed are actually watching this as Simon and I are obviously wearing <laughs> black ties. Uh, so Jackie is, is, is in a suit. Um, we need to let you go because you need to go and get changed for dinner. I'm going to wear a bit of tartan. Uh, excellent. Well, uh, I was going to wear mine tonight, but I thought it'd be t I didn't want to clash well, with no, yours. No, so, I, w I would have um, quite liked it. In hindsight, to, uh, I should have. Anyway. So Jackie, thank you so much. It's always an absolute pleasure talking to you. Enjoy the dinner tonight and happy 50th anniversary for that 69 Formula One World Champion a Championship. Simon, thank you very much. Thank pleasure. you to Alan who's been recording this. We will see you all very soon for another talk show. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye. <laughs>